All right, welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to show you how to create and use materials. Uh, we're just going to take a very cursory look at materials and I'm not going to show you absolutely everything involved with them yet. Uh, but this will be enough to make an object a certain color, a certain transparency, and I'll even show you the uh, texture nodes that you can attach to certain channels um, so that you can get some custom look uh, within Maya's uh, preset uh, options. So I've got this little test scene here with a few primitives so that we can see uh, what's happening to the surfaces of the primitive. Up until now, we've only been using a smooth shade mode, which I believe is this button right here, smooth shade all on the window. Uh, this time we're going to have to use textured mode. And so if you've been using the number keys on the keyboard, uh, three, oh, I'm sorry, four <laughs> being wireframe mode, five being smooth shade, six is the textured view. So make sure you hit six and turn it on to textured view for this. Uh, for some of these things, we may also need to use um, a different rendering mode. I'm going to leave it on default just for now. But when we start using some texture nodes, we may need to change it to high quality rendering so that we can see that effect. Um, and I'll also show you how to render it so that we can see exactly what the effect is. Um, so if you want to apply a material to an object, you have to have them selected in object mode. Uh, the easiest way to apply a material is just to hold down right click. And then down here towards the bottom of this primary menu, we've got assign new material, assign favorite, and assign existing. Um, I'm going to just encourage you for now to stay away from Assign New because that gives you the entire list of options that you really don't need at this point. Um, this entire list is populated. These are the categories. These are the listings. If I just select Favorites Maya, that's the list we get from that Favorites menu. So we don't even need to see this. So I'll just close that. So if you hold down right click and choose Favorite Material, this is a list of types of materials um, that are most commonly used in Maya. So we've got Blin, Lambert, Layered, Fong, Fong E, which I really don't know the difference between those two, uh, Ramp Shader, Surface Shaders, and Background. And so these are the most common types of uh, materials that you would need for uh, basic rendering in Maya. Uh, later on, when you get more advanced, you might start using Mental Ray and uh, Mental Ray uh, materials, which are much, much more powerful, uh, but also more complicated to use. Um, existing materials are the ones that you've already created or the ones that come standard in Maya. This Lambert one is what is already applied to these objects in the scene. In fact, this exists in every scene that you've ever worked on because it's the default for Maya. Um, first things first, do not touch Lambert one. Do not select this, open it up like here. We can view it in the attribute editor if I open that up there. Lambert one, don't alter these settings. Um, you're asking for trouble if you do that. You should always create a new material so that the defaults from project to project are all the same. Um, if you rename Lambert 1, do something to it, you try to combine different files together by importing things, you may mess up your file, you may uh, change the default view of untextured objects, and it's just better housekeeping to make a new one, name it, and do something to it. So don't alter that one. Um, we're always going to make a new material, we're always going to try to name them as well, because eventually when you get a big long list of these, that can get really confusing. Uh, before we make one, just one other thing, there's a second place that you can find the materials uh, lists. You can go to lighting and shading within this rendering drop down menu. Lighting and shading, and we've got new, favorite, and existing right here as well. So if you forget um, the right click menu, then you can always use that one as well. All right, so let's look at some materials. Um, I'm going to go to assign favorite material, Lambert, because Lambert is one of the most basic material types. Okay, so there's a Lambert number three because I was messing around in this file earlier making things. And I'll just call this like my matte um, material. Uh, matte in the sense that this is not shiny. It doesn't have reflectivity. Um, it's basically like cloth or um, a very dull maybe stone or something like that. Something that doesn't contain a specularity attribute to it. Um, going down this list, we can see there's always this note section that pops up. Um, you can write things in there for yourself if you like, but I usually just close that because I don't use it uh, very often. Um, we've got common material attributes at the top, and these attributes are shared between almost all the materials that I'm going to show you. Um, so we've got color first here. Um, the slider is just for brightness. You also want to be careful because if you slide it all the way down or all the way up, it uses it loses its saturation. So if you want to change the color, click on the color chip itself here, and you'll get a color picker. 
Um, your most recently picked colors will uh, uh, populate themselves in this little list here. Uh, and you can control this just like in Photoshop, Illustrator, or any other uh, paint program. We've got the color wheel and a hue and, or sorry, a brightness and saturation field here. Um, so I'll just change it to some bluish color. And then if I slide this all the way up, it becomes bright, bright blue, but all the way down, it actually becomes gray, which is bizarre. Um, so just be careful about that if you turn it all the way to the left-hand side. Um, there you can see the blue color that I had just chosen populating in this list. So if I wanted that color back, I can just click right there and I can get that. Uh, and you can see the results here in the scene. Uh, if you have five still pressed, as in smooth shade, the color will appear uh, because this is not texture yet. This is just the overall color. Um, so if you've not hit six yet, then it should appear normal for now. But when we do color nodes, it will not appear normal. Uh, the next channel is transparency. This will make the object transparent so we can see through it. You can see how it looks maybe gelatinous or like glass or something like that. Um, if you deselect your objects and you want to get back to your material again, you can see that this empties itself. Um, because all of these share the same material, you can select any one of these objects to get back to it, but it will appear in this list of tabs along with the construction history. So we've got polycube, cube shape, polycube one, and matte right now, and matte was the name of the material. Uh, or to go directly to it, you can select an object, right click, and go down to material attributes, and it will snap to this tab uh, instantaneously. That's really helpful when you have a lot of construction history here. There can be quite a lot of tabs sometimes, and you have to look through them. Um, usually it's on the far right hand side, but um, sometimes it's not. So uh, that's just something that you can get this back again. And once more, it's uh, located in the attribute editor, so make sure that window is showing. So the more transparent it is, the harder it is to see. Uh, and actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn off my um, selection highlighting here. So. I have this still selected and I can alter these things, but uh, we can see the result without any interference. So that's going to be more helpful. Okay, so completely invisible and it's still here. You can still select it and do things to it. We just can't see it rendered and then fully visible all the way over to the left. Um, these next two can be a little bit confusing as to how they work. Ambient color is affecting how the color spreads across the surface without regard to shading. So turned up, and you can't really see the result here because we're going to need to render it to see, but you can see it in the thumbnail. Um, turned up, the color kind of spreads all across the object and stops uh, taking on the, the shadow side, stops uh, uh, being occluded by light in the scene. And of course, we have no light in the scene right now, and so it's a little bit of a dull result. Uh, for the best results, these things need to be lit. But um, you can see the preview where it just comes, kind of becomes brighter and brighter. Um, and you can also change the color of that. And so if I gave this like a yellow ambient color, you can see it becomes more green because it's mixing blue and yellow uh, together. And if I dull it down, it's just slightly yellow and then all the way down is a normal blue kind of color. And again, this one desaturates if you move it all the way down. Uh, incandescence, on the other hand, uh, causes the surface to actually glow as if it were a light bulb itself. So the top is pure white, um, which blows out entirely and has no shading whatsoever. Um, but this will actually affect if you do some light simulation, um, it will treat this like a light source and illuminate objects next to it. Um, so it's slightly different and you can color this channel as well. Let's just do a red illumination and you can see it kind of become purple a little bit, although it is really overpowering the incandescence channel. So don't use that unless it is really supposed to be like a light source, like a, an actual light bulb surface or something like that. Um, I think you can color the transparency, although I don't know if that does anything. Uh, let's just try that. It kind of, no, no, I don't think it does anything, uh, which is probably for the best since it's just how visible it is, okay? Bump mapping is a really interesting one. That's where we'll probably come back to it and use some of the texture nodes, but you actually don't have any options whatsoever for this one until you plug in some texture nodes. So we'll skip that for now. Um, diffuse is how much the light spreads across the surface on the lit portions of it. So if I turn this up, you can see we still have dark edges here but it's sort of illuminated or brightened um, the sides that are receiving illumination. And if I turn this down, 
Um, essentially, even though light is shining on it, it's not being absorbed into the surface at all, and so it's not illuminating at all. It's like a black cutout. Oh, whoops, incandescence, diffuse, there we go. Uh, and the default for that was 0.8. Um, if you want things to be a little bit more um, plasticky um, or thin seeming, you can turn up diffuse a bit. Um, translucence, depth, and focus all uh, have to do with how light shines through the object. Um, so we're going to skip those for now because they don't have any relevance to us until we start using lights in the scene. Uh, but if you shined a light on the object where it would normally cast a solid shadow, um, translucence can lighten that shadow or cause light to be focused um, through an object, especially if we turn on things like uh, refractions and make some actual lenses or ice cubes or whatever. Uh, so that's it for the basic Lambert and every material I'm going to show you contains um, some of these. Um, actually some of them are significantly simpler. Uh, the only extra thing I do want to show you is that we've got a special effects tab here with a glow intensity and that provides us uh, a really neat special effect with default uh, Maya software rendering. Um, so I'm going to show you how to render um, an image here so that we can see some of these effects that were hidden from us. Um, up at the top, we've got these little movie clacker icons, four of them. Uh, the one on the left-hand side will just open the render view without actually commanding it to render. Um, but these other two uh, will also open the same render view, so just be aware that that's the one to just bring the window back. Uh, we're going to be using the one on the left of the center too. Uh, IPR is a way to do interactive rendering, but it's very taxing on your machine because it's constantly updating when you change things. Um, so it's really powerful, but we're not going to use it today. Um, this one is for settings and, and uh, sizes and things like that, so we're not going to mess with that uh, for the time being. Uh, this is the one that tells it to actually take a picture from the camera angle. So currently, we're using Maya software rendering, as you can see right here and uh, we are shooting directly from this camera that we're looking at. It'll take whatever active view um, you have at the moment. And so this is what would actually be spit out by the program uh, once you try to export things and make a movie of it. And you can even see our name of our camera down here. Uh, if you want to compare this render to some changed render, uh, we need to save this. Okay, so by saving this, all we do is click this little green button here. Um, this one will get rid of a render. This one will keep the render. Uh, and you're not actually saving a file to disk. This is just to memory so that we can compare it. And it'll give you a little scroll bar down here that will allow us to compare. Um, so I'm going to leave this window open and change something in my material. So for instance, uh, transparency. Okay, So I'll turn the transparency down, hit render again, save it. And now I can check back and forth to see the difference. Okay. So there we go, that's the actual rendered result. So I'm gonna throw the transparency uh, image away. Cannot remove the current image, okay, sure. I'm gonna turn down transparency. Uh, let's try incandescence. Okay, we can save that one. Now, can I remove that transparency one? Let's see, yeah, there we go. Okay, maybe it doesn't allow me to remove the current one. So you can see without incandescence and with incandescence. Uh, we could compare that then with ambient color. So I'll turn the ambient color about halfway up. Render again. Whoops, sorry. Render again. Save it. And you can see the difference between incandescence and uh, ambient color. Okay, so this can be very helpful for you um, to see the difference between some of these channels and others uh, to get a really accurate comparison. Uh, and like I said, some of these effects will not even appear until we render them. Um, so for instance, I'm going to turn diffuse back to 0.8 and we're going to turn up glow intensity. Okay, so glow intensity I'll turn up to like, I don't know, anywhere, 0.3 something. Uh, and you can see in this window, we're not getting that result. There's just nothing happening. Um, so it's a render only result here. So if I hit render and save that, you can see clearly that is glowing, you know, just like it was a firefly or a light bulb or something. Um, this can get overwhelming. So if I turn this up very high, oh man, it's like Tron or something like that. Um, there's another attribute which is really cool about glow. Um, if you hit this button hide source in render, essentially you get ghosts, little ghost images. So all of the faces on those surfaces are rendering without any of the shading on those surfaces. So uh, I think that's a really cool effect. If I turn this down a little bit, 
you get uh, a little bit of a dimmer ghost. It's really cool to do this on like a human model or something like that because then it just looks like a really incorporeal person, which is just awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna turn that back off, turn the uh, glow intensity back off um, so we can return to a normal render. Okay, nice default render there. All right, um, let's go ahead and move on to another material type. Just make sure I have everything selected here still. Right click, favorite material, and we're gonna do a blin. Okay, I'm gonna name the blin shiny. Okay, the blin material is one of the more complicated uh, shaders to use, but it's very powerful. It can achieve lots of different results. Um, as you can see, we've got these common material attributes on the top again. I'm just gonna set this to a different color than we used, um, say, orange or so, so that I can differentiate it between my matte uh, and my shiny material. We've got transparency, we've got ambient color, we've got incandescence, just like we did before, bump mapping, which we'll return to, diffuse, translucency, but below that section, we've got a specular shading section. Um, so if you can see, there's this kind of highlight on this image right here. Uh, I'll go ahead and render, just as is, and you're getting a highlight on the sphere, but if I move the camera around, you can see a highlight kind of travels around on these objects and it's because of the default Maya uh, lighting that we're getting that. So at certain angles, I get a highlight on the cylinder, for instance. So here I've got cylinder and uh, sphere highlighting together. Um, so I'll use uh, something like that angle. Let me just blow them up in here a little bit, move off slightly so I can get a little uh, read on the cube, render it. Uh, yeah, we'll use that as our default um, for this one. Okay, now these will control the way that that specular highlight renders on these objects. Um, we've got the color of the specular highlight. So if I choose, for instance, like red, right? The highlight is red, but the material is orange. And so that can give you a little bit of depth with more complicated um, shaders. So for instance, maybe if I set this to something a little bit more yellow, okay? then it could start to look like maybe some sort of metallic uh, bronze or foil or something like that. Uh, we've got eccentricity, which controls how thin or broad the highlight is. So turned very far up, it fills most of the lit side and turned very far down, it becomes a pinpoint or a sliver. Uh, we lost it entirely on the, on the cylinder there. Let's see, did I get it back? No, I don't even get it back there, but you can see, like if I turn it very, very, very far down, that's like a glossy marble or something like that. Uh, the specular roll off right underneath that uh, works in conjunction with eccentricity. This is how quickly the highlight goes from completely highlighted to completely unhighlighted. So how quickly it moves from uh, opaque to transparent. Um, so if I turn this up, it becomes a quicker roll off, therefore more strength in the center and almost nothing immediately. And if I turn this down, it becomes more dull. So a high eccentricity and a low specular roll off means that the result is very subtle, almost like a matte material at that point. Uh, and a very low eccentricity with a very high specular roll off means it's a very glossy, um, very sharp, clear highlight. The reflectivity channel down here is how much of an image um, would be produced uh, when moving an object next to another object. You can actually see a reflected image. In order to show you that though, we would have to explore the rendering menu, which I'm really not gonna do today. We're gonna wait until we do lighting for that. And so just know that this default number is set to 0.5, which is half a reflection. 100% is a perfect mirror, uh, and zero is no reflection at all. Uh, and since we're not really going to see the result. It doesn't matter what we set that to at this point. Um, and it's also got the special effects uh, as well there. Okay, so Lambert for matte materials, Blin for shiny materials. Let's go ahead and view the next one. Right click and hold favorite material, Fong. Okay, I'm going to use Fong instead of Fongy um, just because I'm not really clear on the difference between the two, but Fong is another shiny material using a slightly different method. 
Um, so a thong has all the basic colors, of course. I'm going to change this one to some sort of green. Let's do like that right there. All the basic common material attributes and the specular shading is a little bit more uh, simplistic in this one. So the cosine power will create either a very broad um, highlight or a very thin pinpoint highlight. So it's two in one. It's both the width and the strength of the highlight. Uh, again, we've got a color associated with it. So if I change this to like say blue, like that, then you can see a blue highlight on there. I've got a kind of a bad angle here. Mm, I can't seem to get the correct angle to get the highlight on any of the other stuff, but I think you get the idea. It's got reflectivity as well. Um, I usually use Fong for mirrors. So when I want a perfectly um, reflecting mirror or a chrome-like effect, I use Fong's. Um, for anything that requires a little bit more complication, say like metals and plastics, I use Blin. Um, so I'll just name this one like metal, or I'm sorry, I'll name this like uh, mirror. Okay, so you can use it for that sort of thing. And we've got the same um, special effects down here as well if you want those. Okay, the next one I'm going to show you, assign favorite. Um, I usually don't use ramp shader because you can uh, plug in a ramp to any material. Um, I have used layer shaders and I like them, but let's just skip that one because it's a little bit more complicated. So essentially, you can put one shader on top of another on top of another and create a really nice composite effect. So if you wanted to make like a shader for the earth, you might want to use a layered shader. Uh, I'm going to show you though a surface and a background shader uh, because those are uh, very useful. So a surface shader first is very simple. It has out color, out transparency, out glow color, out matte opacity. Um, whatever color you set this to, it will render that and only that. Oops. Just that, no shading. Even if there were lights, we would not be seeing a lit result. So I can set that to any old thing I want. And that is all we're going to get. So this is more useful like cart for cartoon types of shaders. And in fact, when I make uh, more cartoony um, textured objects as well, I plug my texture into the out color so that it, it would ignore any lighting in the scene and you get just the painted result, which is rather pleasing if it's done carefully. Um, out opacity, if I turn this down, we can see the result of that, that it is the same sort of treatment that these are um, able to be seen through and that is able to be seen through and we can see through that. So no real surprises there. Um, and we've got glow as well, which treats it very similarly to the other glow channels. Although that was rather nice result. It kind of looks nice and soft there. Okay. There we go. Out matte opacity. I've had mixed results with success to this, but if I turn this down, I believe mm, that it's supposed to treat this as um, transparent if there are other objects in the scene, but I'm not 100% on that. I haven't needed to use that very often, especially for basic rendering things. So you can always look up uh, what that one does, but I'm not entirely sure for that one. Okay, so that is a surface shader. Use that for more cartoony um, special effects type of stuff. Okay, the next one, I'm gonna go ahead and reassign uh, to these objects my matte shader, existing matte, okay? And then just on one of them, so I'll take the uh, cylinder for instance, I'm going to apply favorite background. Okay, so this one we're not seeing any result. It's just kind of like gray and I need to overlap this over other objects before it will work. Okay, so here it is overlapped over some matte objects when I hit render. Essentially use background means whatever the camera's background is set to, use that and only that. So it creates a uh, punch out in the image. So even though this is in front of those things, even though they're behind it, it's not treating it as transparent it's treating it as a uh, big hole in the image, okay? So if you need things to disappear in your images, that could be a very helpful way to achieve something like that. Um, so that an object just goes behind a hidden used background object and just goes away entirely and ceases rendering. Um, those ones, now strangely enough, 
they started including reflectivity on these things and so I've had some really poor results from this recently. Um, turn the specular color all the way to black, turn the reflectivity all the way off and now it's a perfect punch out. Um, I really wish that the defaults were set to these but you do have the ability to have a reflection on this punch out or a specular highlight on this punch out. I'm not really sure what you would use that for um, but it's there and it's available if you absolutely need it. Okay. Cool. So those are the basic material types that I want you to know about. So matte shiny, a different sort of shine that's a little bit more simplistic. Use a strict color and also um, this used background which creates a hole in your image. Um, those are the basic material types that you really need. Um, let's go ahead and explore the uh, texture nodes. Okay. So here I'm on my matte uh, texture. And if I click one of these little checker boxes, it will give me the option to hook up a texture node. Okay, so let's click on colors little checker box here and it will bring up this big long list. Don't mess with the left hand side of this menu. These are the different categories but the ones highlighted are the ones that are relevant to you right now. Um, and start towards the top uh, working your way down there are less and less frequently used ones for beginners but more useful for uh, more advanced users. The ones towards the top are more frequently used for um, beginner users of Maya. Uh, and let's just do uh, bold here, the very first one. So you can see that this is a pattern made up of little um, gradient bulges in kind of a square there. And our attribute editor has jumped to another node here, so the bulge one is the node. And we've got two channels, U width and V width. So if we turn those up and down, you can see the gaps between the bulges grow, and they grow in this direction as well. So you've got you know a limited ability to kind of dial this in to what you would want to do with it. Uh, we've also got some color balance, and this is something you frequently want to use. Uh, our color gain, we can change that into a color. There we go. Our color offset, let's change that to like a dark red or something. And now we've got some real customization with it. Uh, the default color you can uh, move up and down, but sometimes it doesn't do anything, sometimes it does. Uh, let's see if I do an orange. Yeah, I'm not really seeing any result there, but the gain, the gain and the offset are definitely important for the look of this particular color node. Now, you may be asking yourself how to get back to the basic material. You've got these two little buttons here. Uh, a arrow going into a box and an arrow exiting a box and that's your input and output connections so this node outputs to the color channel so I click the output to get to this color channel um, then you can see where there used to be a checker box on this color there's now an input so we, if we want to see what the input for color is we click that and we're back to our bulge channel okay uh, if we click input for bulge one we go deeper to the two-dimensional placement of this particular um, pattern, which can be helpful as well because we've got some channels here which uh, are helpful for fine-tuning and adjusting the way that this spreads across the surface. So here we've got the rotate frame, um, so I can make this a 45-degree angle instead of a 90-degree angle if I wanted to. And you've also got repeat um, UV, so both um, U and V. U and V um, are the dimensions for textures. Just think of them as up and down and left and right. So the first one here, if I click, uh, let me turn this back to a normal here. Um, this first one, if I increase this number, say to like 16, so this horizontal dimension is repeated over and over and over and over again, 16 times, while this one's only repeated four times. And if I turn that down, say to one, so now there's only one stretch of this texture going across here. And you can see I've kind of created a circus or a beach ball there on the sphere. Whereas the bottom looks like maybe some sort of futuristic grate or something like that. Okay, So those are typical um, starting positions, four and four, um, for these. Um, just to get an idea of what it would be like to tile it across the surface. But you can definitely come in and mess with this stuff and figure out what it all does. You can also add noise. This one's really fun. If a normal and let me turn this back up again 16 and 16 so if uh, oh, it's almost a picnic blanket if a normal grid is not what you want you can add noise here uh, which will create ripples in the the pattern so let me do like a 0.5 noise 
So you can see like a noise vertically. Maybe this was too much. Let me do eight and eight. Okay. Uh, and noise in this direction. How about one? And now we've basically got a full static pattern. Um, we do need to render this sometimes to see what the result is. And as you can see, let me zoom in. Um, it's not actually static. It's more like a lava lamp or something like that. Um, let me turn down the noise in this one to zero. So we can see it only going in one direction. Um, so it appears that this is the direction this way that the noise is being applied in because there isn't any noise going this direction here. Let me turn it down farther to a very subtle amount. How about 0.1? Okay, there we go. So you can see there's still lines going through this surface, but they're just be, they've just become jagged lines. How about even less? How about like 0 0.01? I want to try to get a wavy effect without making it insane. Um, there you can go. Just a little bit of disturbance that way. Um, how about three? Three times more? There we go. A little bit of waviness almost like a puzzle or something like that without it actually breaking up entirely. So you want to be careful with these numbers. Too high and it becomes very chaotic, uh, too low, and uh, it's going to just look like the basic material anyway. Uh, but notice that our render here, or our, our preview window, is not showing what the, the rendered results are. Um, so you do have to render it to see a lot of these texture node results. So if we want to go back up to our bulge node, we hit the output button, which is the bottom one. And if we want to go all the way back out to our texture, our material, sorry, uh, you hit the output once more and we're back here. Okay. Um, if you don't like that um, node anymore and you want to break it off of this channel, you can just right click the word and choose break connection and it will default back to whatever it was set to. Um, so now it's back to just a flat yellow. Okay. It's worth noting that you don't have to just apply these texture nodes to the color channel. You can apply it to any channel whatsoever. So let's try it on transparency. Okay, Color node or render node. And how about a fractal? Okay, So that pattern there is going to affect the transparency of this object. So if I hit render, what you can see is, uh, actually it's best displayed right there on the cube because it's got objects behind it. Some parts of the cube are perfectly opaque and some parts are perfectly transparent based on this uh, formula here. Uh, if I turn amplitude down, you can see that it becomes more and more gray until it's just a matte gray. And the threshold will affect where the white point and black point are on the image. So if I turn this up, there's gonna be more solid opaque uh, with more solid uh, transparent rather than a mixture. So if I turn this down, I should get more mixture where it's just kind of a cloudy transparency at that point. Okay, um, And I don't even begin to know what all of these different channels do on all of these texture nodes. Uh, mess around with them, experiment, and find out what works for you. Uh, but there are tons of these texture nodes and it's very difficult to memorize what every single one of them does. Um, let's try something different. So bump mapping is one that I promised we'd look at. Bump mapping will create the appearance, or the, the illusion rather, of um, surface detail where none exists. So I'm going to just make sure I have a couple of these objects framed. Render. And I'll go ahead and save that render for um, comparison. And let's clip, click the bump mapping uh, texture node checker. And what would be good for this? Hmm, let's see, how about a Brownian texture? Okay, so Brownian uh, is what I clicked on. It's a 3D texture, so you can see this little um, box has popped up here, but I'm not gonna move my camera. I'm just gonna render, and you can see, wow, the whole surface is now covered in fine bumps and undulations. Now, bumps have an extra node between the uh, output, which is the uh, full material, and the input, which is the actual color here. But when you click that input, like see how I just clicked that input and it jumped here? If I click the output button, it will first go to this bump 3D node, then it will return to the normal uh, material. That's because this is affecting how deep the bump effect is. So if all you need to do is turn up the intensity or down the intensity, 
you should do it right here with this number. Um, so if I turn this down to a fraction of a whole number, you can see that nothing has changed with regards to how the Brownian um, is created. It's just that it's not as deep anymore, which makes it a lot more satisfying. Also, in some of these, if you prefer to have the bumps go in rather than out, you can enter in a negative number. So let's do uh, negative 0.5. In this case, we're probably not going to get a spectacular result. Yeah, because a Brownian goes up and down anyway. Um, but in the case of like uh, checkers, you can invert which checkers are up and which checkers are down. Or in the tile setting, you can use that one to make the grout stick out or the grout stick down. So I'll go ahead and return this back to uh, 0.5, positive 0.5 because it's subtle enough to show what's happening but uh, not be overwhelming. Uh, this button right here, this bump value, is the actual texture node, the Brownian. Um, they, some of these have some really weird names. Lacunarity is uh, how turbulent it is. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine, lacunarity. So low lacunarity, like this. Okay, I'll, I'll save that one. High lacunarity is like this. Okay, so low turbulence, there's none, low turbulence, high turbulence, sure, okay. Increment, mm, the higher I turn it, the more solid gray it appears to be. The lower I turn it, the more contrast. I think let's just call that one contrast. I'll save this one with a very low number, which it appears to be high contrast, and then with a much higher number, yeah, that's sort of what it appears to be. Um, you just have to mess around with these things to kind of figure out what it is they do. Okay, octaves, let's see. Oh, there appears to be a fine grain that was uh, formulating when I turned this up. So yeah, a much more turbulent fine grain there. Let's see, a lower lacunarity, a higher octave. Hmm, kind of interesting. So you can play around with these and find out you know, what they're doing. I may have just stumbled upon like a granite type of look or something like that or um, some sort of stone. Uh, you can definitely make this look like the pores in fruit or something like that. Um, not too difficult to figure that out. Uh, and then we've got these weights. Again, your guess is almost as good as mine. 0.5 in this direction and it appears to be stretched. So it's sort of like uh, altering the, the different dimensions in which these things are moving three-dimensionally. Um, let me just do like zero in this direction, see if that comes out to anything. So now vertically, it's perfectly stretched um, into infinity, which is not very nice looking, uh, but it's an option, you know, if you need to do something like that. 0.3, yeah, okay, it's somewhat stretched, but not entirely. Um, I've never really come across a, a situation where I needed to affect those for this particular one. I think that treating them as equal is good enough. Uh, the color balance in this case is not really going to do anything because bump is based on a black and white value. So the white sections of the um, texture are the hills and the black sections are the valleys. Okay, so typically. Uh, unless you invert this number and then it will be the opposite of what you expect it to be. Okay, so bumps can be oops, really fun to mess around with. Uh, let me go ahead and just do one more. I'm going to right click on bump mapping break connection, hit the texture node icon again, and let's do uh, grid because I happen to know that this one um, has a much clearer difference between um, what is up and what is down. So right now it appears that the, hmm, actually it's a little bit tough to tell. It kind of looks to me like the um, lines here are sticking up and the tiles are sticking down, but let's see what it's doing. Yeah, actually they are. Um, so the grout is white and so it's sticking up. The tiles are black so they're sticking down. So we could, if we wanted to, um, change this to a negative one to affect that, but as you can see we've also got line color and filler color, so I could just swap these colors and it should do the same thing. Yeah, so now the tiles appear to rise and the grout appears to fall down. Um, we've got the width for each side, and we can eliminate it entirely to just make stripes instead, if we'd like to. And of course, like I told you guys before, um, any channel which has this texture box on it can have an additional node attached to it. Okay, so in this case, I'll change um, the grout width to 0.2. Oh, 
Okay, now this is how it appears. Um, let's affect the repeating as well. So I'm going to, oops, go into the input node and change the repeat to be like eight in each direction. I just want a few tiles visible. Okay, there we go. We can see a bunch of tiles now. Uh, output, back to the grid. I'm going to change the color of the tile surface to be something a little bit more turbulent. And so how about a mountain? Okay, mountain is basically like television static or so. Now we want this to be fairly light because the, ooh, that's gross. I'm going to turn the, there we go. So we want it to be fairly light because these are the uh, parts that should remain high um, throughout because the tiles are being raised. So now when I render this, you can see raised tiles, which are also themselves kind of turbulent, um, each one of them. Uh, and you can mess around with all of these different, you know, settings and whatever, what have you. Let me just turn that down a little bit more. There we go, nice and subtle on that sphere. Um, so maybe like ceramic tiles or something like that. Okay, uh, and we can do the same thing to the grout. So I'm going to do the output for this mountain is the color for the filler on our grid. Uh, for the line color, let's connect a node to that. What should I do for the line color? How about, well, leather would be funny. Let's just do a, a granite. Granite is a different method of providing noise. This one has multiple colors for the noise. So the overall filler color should be black because this is the, um, the um, valley. And then these three colors are all different spots that you can vary. Um, so these all look fairly dark for a start. Uh, might just be the preview. Let me try. Hmm. I don't really see any difference there. Let's turn a bunch of these up to see if we can find a difference. No, I'm not seeing anything at all. This could be because of the scale of this. Um, so I could go to the input of this um, and see, like, we've got scale on this three-dimensional texture. Um, it might be too large, it might be too small. I would have to play with it to find out. Uh, or it could just be that this filler color here is drowning out all of the detail. It's tough to say. So I would mess around with this, like if I want to find out uh, what's going on here. Uh, I may need to zoom in the camera farther to find out. Uh, but it just appears like that one, that line color one, is not working. Uh, for this particular one. So let me just pick a different one. Break connection there. And let's do, how about a checker? Okay, so you can see like every grout line is divided in two now, which is interesting. Uh, I'm going to choose the input for that and repeat this a lot more. So how about like 30, 30. Let's see how that does. There we go almost like a, a brick texture in the grout only. So we're getting really weird here. Um, let's see the output to that. Uh, I will turn the secondary color down a bit so this should soften the, the brick effect. There we go. So we have, I've got like a checker pattern grout which with a um, somewhat turbulent kind of soft uh, tile. Yeah, a, a really strange sort of occurrence, but there you go. Um, we're able to get some very interesting compound results here. And navigating all the way back out, you can see I'm back out to the basic color. Um, so why not, since we're messing around with it, do something to the color. So I'll put a texture node on the color. Let's set it to uh, leather. <laughs> Leather's a weird one. There we go. So we've got a really dark red splotchy leather. I guess I should turn that color up so that we can see the render a little bit more easily. There we go. So the color is leathered, but the texture is still the same because that's in the bump channel down there. Uh, and we could do the same thing here if we wanted to. So on this leather color, set it to like a yellow so that I can just see it really easily. Um, we can mess around with things like the cell size, make it really big or bigger. Oops, cell size. I would need to enter in something bigger, I think. Yeah, two or three or what have you to make it really large. There we go. It's almost like light shining on this surface now as opposed to the actual surface texture, which is interesting. 
um, the density, let me turn the cell size back down so we can see it in the preview. Um, the density, less dense, means that this becomes like spots instead of solid leather. Spottiness, which is um, how much gap there is between individual cells. No spottiness at all. We should start to get a more dense grid. So let me see, full density, no spottiness, no randomness. You can see a um, pattern emerging here. Okay, and then the threshold all the way, actually not all the way, that one's not going to work. Okay, there we go, creases. Uh, and now we should have, yeah, a very regular pattern across this surface. Not very attractive looking, but something that you could use to achieve certain effects, okay? So that is basically all you need to know um, for this week, for making materials. The last thing I want to show you is just that there is a place where you can view all of your materials together, okay, called the hypershade. Um, so up in Windows, render, or sorry, rendering editors, hypershade, um, this window that pops up here is the entire list of all the textures that you make named, okay, up in the top here. You can see additional textures over on the left hand side and then a work area. If you middle mouse drag one of these chips to the bottom, and then right click in graph network that is everything that I created for you all laid out in a grid so you can select any one of these nodes visually and it will pop up in the attribute editor so this can be a much easier way to navigate um, around in your um, hierarchy to get the effects that you want now connecting and disconnecting things in here is a little bit more complicated than I'm willing to show you at the moment um, the last thing I would want you to use this for is just an easy way to apply materials. I think we can drag them directly. Middle mouse drag, by the way. Middle mouse drag down to here. Middle mouse drag from here onto an object, and that will assign it. There we go. Several different shaders assigned. And you can also delete shaders. So if I grab this one right here and just hit delete, that shader is now gone from my library. Remember, do not touch Lambert 1. Also, don't touch this particle cloud 1 or this shader um, glow, shader glow, that's odd, that's not familiar to me, but yeah, don't touch these three then, uh, only touch the ones that you've created and know that those are the, the ones that you can alter and affect, okay? So our homework this week is going to ma be making three objects on a theme, and we are going to texture those objects, okay? So you're going to use these materials to affect parts of the object. Okay, very last thing before I let you go is that you do not have to apply these shaders to the entire object. You can apply it only to parts of the object if you like, uh, namely faces. So on this cube here, I'm gonna select the top face, right click and hold, assign existing, how about shiny? Okay, so we've got the orange color on the top of the cube and green colors on the rest of the cube. We can do this for the entire half of a sphere if we'd like to. So I'll line up my camera on the side, make a nice little slice through the object. Right click and hold, assign existing uh, mirror. Okay, so you can see we've got a half and half sphere for that material as well. Um, for the time being, since you can only apply these to faces, make sure that you have um, a line or an edge drawn on your objects that defines the difference between two materials if you want to have two materials. Um, so an example of that would be if I wanted to cut this cylinder in half in an eccentric way, I would just go ahead and use the interactive split tool and make maybe a jagged kind of cut through this object like this. Uh, imagine that this is maybe like uh, frosting on the top of a cake or something like that. And of course, I would take much more time and care to trace it out, but this should serve for an example. And there, enter. I'm going to seal the last two up there. And so now the top portion of this can be favorite Lambert. And I'll make it like pink or something. and the bottom of that could be whatever I wanted it to be. Okay, so that's it for this week. Use textures and materials to make the objects look somewhat realistic. Be sure to use texture nodes. That is required that you use texture nodes in some capacity, either for altering the color 
we're altering the bump of the object. I'll give you one little last render there so that you can see all of the compound results that we've achieved. And I will see you next week.